Welcome. I'm so glad that you joined us. Welcome to church. My name is Tim Drury. I am one of the pastors at First Baptist Bethalto, and we are so glad that you joined us. Maybe you're brand new to FBC, and I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, maybe a friend invited you to, to join, uh, or maybe you just saw the, the service happening on Facebook Live and you decided you would join us. Thanks for tuning in and uh, being here with us this morning. We believe that Jesus is the hope for this life and the life to come. He is the foundation of our faith. My hope for you this morning is that you will seek God with all of your heart. Scripture says that when we seek Him, we will find Him. See, God isn't hiding from us. He is around us all the time. But the, we get busy in life. It takes crisis in our lives to cry out to God. We search for Him in all kinds of ways and we come up empty. This morning, my hope is that you don't leave empty, but that you have connected with God. So I'm thankful that each and every one of you have tuned in this morning. This week, we had, we had a start uh, to a new week that none of us have ever lived here in Illinois. And that was um, with our shelter-in-place order that our governor had issued. Man, that changed the whole week. Um, for some of us, life went on as usual uh, because you serve in a mission-critical area. And I just want to thank you for uh, going and serving in that area. Our health care providers, our grocery store workers, our communications folks. I realized this week that without internet and cell phones, I would be really, really bored. Maybe you experienced that as well if you stayed home. This week, I learned to work from home. In fact, that's where I am right now. I'm in my home. I am worshiping with you from my home. And see, everything that uh, you will experience today in our service is in homes because we're in this with you as well. As we worship together, as we read scripture together, we're doing it in our homes because this uh, shelter in place has affected us as pastors as well. This week has taught me that community is vitally important to my spiritual health. I miss you all and I miss getting to worship and corporate worship together. Man, do I miss that. But I'm thankful that we have this platform to be able to share this experience together. When we come to worship, we remind ourselves about truths about God. We give praise to God through singing of songs and, and then we read the word and we pray together. We also are able to give, and so we do that online. If you go to fbcbethalto.org slash giving, uh, you can be able to uh, take part in online giving, uh, or you can drop your, your offering off at the mailbox at the church office. And so I just know there's a couple different ways that you can give and be a part of worship that way. In this time of isolation and being uh, physically distanced from each other, we can still create community. So let me give you two ways you can help create community this morning. One is use the Watch Party feature on Facebook if you're watching there and share uh, this uh, worship service with your friends and invite them to watch with you and participate with you. And so start that party and invite your friends. It's a great way uh, to have them be a part of it. You can also share our link, fbcbethalto.org slash live, and through a text with an individual or send that out through Messenger or other so, uh, social media forms, and they can join in. Those friends on those other platforms can join in on what we are doing this morning. The second way that you can help create community is take a photo or a video of your family this morning in worship and then post that to your social media platforms. And then I want you to use this hashtag. Um, for those of you that maybe not know what a hashtag is, that's the pound sign on your phone. And so, uh, but use that hashtag and uh, hashtag at FBCB Watch Party. That's hashtag FBCB Watch Party. And in using that hashtag, it helps others know what is going on. If you click on that hashtag, it's actually a live link that starts pulling everybody else that's using it and you get to see the community 
of our church worshiping together this morning. That's a great thing. We want to see that. We want to see the community that you can build online. So take pictures, share them, hashtag them with FBCB Watch Party. First Baptist Church Bethalto Watch Party. FBCB Watch Party. This week, I've also learned that I'm not still. I don't like stillness. I don't like um, being separated from others. But I'm reminded of what the psalmist tells us in two different places about God. In Psalm 46, verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I've been challenged this week, church, to be still and to take advantage of this time where I have some free time to be still before the Lord and let Him know the troubles that are on my heart. Also in Psalm 94, verses 17 through 19, we read this. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against the evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolation cheers my soul. This morning, may your soul be cheered up. May you be able to experience that God is in control and that He loves you and that He is a fortress, a shelter, a place of calm in the storm. Would you join me in praying this morning and asking that our hearts be filled with God's presence. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for in those small, still moments this week, you reminded me that you are in control. While the world is absolutely going crazy, you are calm. That COVID-19 did not surprise you, it did not sneak up on you that the fact that we would be sheltering in place while that was a, a surprise to many of us, it didn't surprise you, Father, because you're in control. And Lord, so in the midst of all the chaos that we experience in life, may we remember that you are in control, that you are God. While our feet slip at times, or we feel like that we're out of control, maybe we got news this week, Father, that we've lost our job. May we remember that you are in control. And this morning, as we yield our lives to you and we seek you with our hearts, Father, would you bring joy to our souls? Would you bring joy restoration to a broken spirit? Would you encourage us that we could go and live and let others know that Jesus is in control and that He is the foundation and the hope that we have within us? Thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to be able to worship together. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. Shelters the honor 
spread his wings and so gently sustain it. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained? to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love we sin on him. 
kingdom was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth this day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine born with the precious in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of Returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Just plead, listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, it does not rise from deceitful lips. May my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart and you examine me at night, though you test me, you will find nothing. I have resolved that my mouth will not sin. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept myself from the ways of the violent. My steps have held to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me. O God, incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths, they speak arrogantly. They have surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children, and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Well, here we are again for the second Sunday in a row uh, doing virtual church. Last Sunday was a most unusual day, not only here in America, but uh, all around the world. A Christian blogger that I uh, follow with some regularity uh, put it in perspective, I think. Here's what he wrote just last Monday. Would it be an exaggeration to say that Sunday, March 22, 2020, was one of the most unusual Sundays in the history of Christianity. He then answers his own question as follows. I don't think it would be, because on this day, the majority of Christians across the world were either not permitted to gather to worship or considered it inadvisable to do so. 
Then by way of summation, he wrote the following. Where on a typical Sunday, Christians rise in their homes and soon gather for corporate worship, on this Sunday, Christians rose in their homes and then stayed there, many to worship virtually through recorded or live-streamed services. So today, thanks to modern technology, uh, we are able to meet again in this fashion since we can't actually assemble together in our normal places of worship. As I mentioned last Sunday, these are stressful times, and there are a lot of folks who are stressed out. And so it seemed appropriate to me that we should consider the lyrics of a song that was written by a man who was going through a very stressful time in his own life. I happen to be talking about a Bible character named David. Here's a bit of background on what we're going to look at in a moment. The book of Psalms in the Old Testament contains 150 psalms, or songs, or hymns, if you prefer. In reality, the psalms were an ancient Hebrew hymn book, and about half of those 150 psalms were actually written by David. Sometimes they were hymns of praise, praising Creator God for His goodness and greatness. At other times, they were hymns or prayers of petition, as the psalmist makes known his request to the Lord in prayer. Occasionally, they were actually laments, as the psalmist expressed sorrow or regret about some lamentable circumstance in his own life. Such is the case with the 17th Psalm, the very psalm that, in fact, you heard read just a few moments ago. Identified in the text itself, as a prayer of David, I like to think of it as a psalm for the distressed. It is most definitely a psalm that can encourage the heart and gets one's focus where it needs to be during stressful times. At any given moment in time, there will always be those who are stressed out. There will always be those who are going through difficult times. It just so happens that more of us have the same shared experiences at this moment in time. But let's be honest about something. There are always those who bear unimaginable sorrow, who struggle with grief over things that sometimes they cannot even discuss with others, people who struggle with physical pain for which there seems to be no relief, people who experience loneliness, despair, overwhelming discouragement, hurts and disappointments of all kinds. And here in the 17th Psalm is a prayer for such people. It's a prayer for all who are distressed for whatever reason. It's a prayer for those who are melancholy in spirit. It's a prayer for those who are discouraged, even to the point of being depressed. But whoever you are and whatever your distress may be, this is a prayer for you. Now, we don't actually know for certain what David's situation was when he wrote this psalm, but it quite obviously was during a time of terrific trouble, a time of difficulty and discouragement, and therefore the cause of a major stress in his life. It may have been when he was a young man and was on the run from King Saul, who regarded David as a threat and wanted him dead. Or it may have been much later in his life when he was the king, but a king in exile, after he was forced to flee the capital city in fear for his own life because Absalom, his own son, had wrested the throne away from him. Talk about trials and tribulations. David had them. I think that I said something last week about if David had been born in a different era, he could have been the one who wrote the lyrics to that familiar lament, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Whatever may have been the occasion for this particular psalm, the wording of David's prayer reveals at least three important things. Number one, that even the best of saints often suffer the worst of troubles. Number two, that there was an incredibly high level of stress in David's life. 
And number three, that he did incre incredibly important things to decompress from all of that stress. The short answer to what he did is this. He turned to God. But that actually oversimplifies a much more complex response on David's part. So let's break it down. What was it that David did in order to turn to God? And again, the short answer is simple. He prayed. But the truth is, lots of people pray, but still don't really turn to God. The thing that made David's prayer so effective was his amazing candor with the Lord. By the way, the best prayers are always those prayers that are the most honest. And that is true whether your heart is rejoicing or in extreme distress. I want to repeat something that I said last week about the importance of honest prayers. There's no reason not to be honest. God already knows exactly what's in your heart and on your mind. So to not be honest with him is actually to be patently guilty of hypocrisy. And yet, that is precisely what we are often guilty of doing. May I remind you that there is absolutely nothing in Scripture that encourages us to stifle our feelings of frustration and disappointment whenever we come to God in prayer? In fact, if there is one time when you can be totally transparent, it's when you pray. You can't actually hide anything from God anyway, so why try? Just be honest. That's what David does in Psalm 17, and as such, he gives us a paradigm for prayer. This particular psalm has four stanzas, and that will form the outline for looking at the content of this prayer. Last week, we looked at the first stanza, and we'll review that in a moment. And today, we'll examine the second stanza, and then we'll get to the last two stanzas um, down the road. The first stanza is verses 1 through 4, and its theme is, Hear Me. Notice how David begins with a cry for God to listen to his plea. In fact, three times in the very first verse, he makes this plea for God to hear him. Number one, hear a just cause, O Lord. Number two, attend to my cry. Number three, give ear to my prayer. And then David basically continues his plea to be heard in verses 2 through 4. Among the many things that we said last week about this first stanza, there is one thing that I want to revisit. As David makes his plea for God to hear him, he does so on the basis of what he calls in verse 1, a just cause. Now, that not only means that he believes that what he is asking for is just, it also means that he believes that he is on praying ground. And by that I mean that his conscience is clear and his heart is right, so that he now has every right to come to God in prayer. Verse 3 is very interesting, primarily because most of us don't ever pray like this. Listen to what David says to the Lord. You have tried my heart, you have visited me by night, you have tested me, and you will find nothing. Now, at first blush, this might seem like an expression of pharisaical self-righteousness. But in reality, it's not that at all. Instead, what we have here is an example of a man who has clearly cleared his conscience before God. What he now is saying, in effect, is this. Lord, you have already tested and tried my heart, and there is no hidden sin there. There is no unconfessed sin that I have tried to sweep under the rug. Now, to be sure, David is not claiming to be without sin. Several times, in fact, in some of the other Psalms, he confesses his sinfulness. And by doing so, he has done what every Christian should do, with his sin. And now, because he has confessed his sin by getting in agreement with God about the sinfulness of his sin, he is able to claim God's forgiveness. And as we know, when God forgives, it's as if it never happened at all. So when David says that God had tested him, 
and tried him and found nothing. He is not saying that there was never any sin in his life. He's not saying that he never ever sins. Quite to the contrary. He is saying that sin that was once there is no longer there because he has been forgiven and been cleansed by the Lord. And all of that simply because he got in agreement with God about his guilt, because that's what real confession is all about. Dear Christian friend, let's never forget the truth of this amazing promise found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where it says if we confess our sins, literally if we get in agreement with God about our sins, or to put it another way, if we say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin, then there is this amazing promise. He will forgive our sin and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let's move to the second stanza. The theme of the first stanza was, hear me. The theme of the second stanza, which is in verses five through seven, is hold me. And here is more evidence that David's plea back in verses three and four is in fact not a self-righteous boast. In fact, David effectively acknowledges that the only way that he can keep from sinning is not by his own power, but by God's power. Listen to what he says in those verses that we are calling the second stanza. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. You can tell from what David says that he knows that on his own, he lacks the strength and the ability to walk this path without slipping. So what does he do? He calls upon the Lord to hold him, i.e. to keep him from slipping. When he says to the Lord there in verse six, I call upon you, there's intensity in those words. He is in effect pleading with the Lord. Keep in mind that in ancient Hebrew literature, repetition was a literary device that was used for emphasis. They couldn't put it in bold face type because they didn't have type. They couldn't put it in italics because that wasn't an option when everything was handwritten. So when they wanted to give emphasis to something, they simply repeated it. And that's exactly what David does in verse six. Not once, not twice, but three times. He makes his plea to God. I call upon you, incline your ear to me, hear my words. In fact, I think it can be legitimately argued that the first phrase of verse seven is yet another expression of David's intensity in crying out to the Lord in prayer. This time the verbiage sounds like this. Wondrously show your steadfast love. One translation puts it like this. Show me the wonders of your great love. And for David at that moment, Answered prayer would be the greatest evidence of God's love to him. Now, notice also in verse 7 that he acknowledges that God is his Savior. And that's important to point out that not only can God save him from his sins, but also from his enemies, as you see there in verse 7. Now, one's enemies might be a difficult neighbor, but it might also be an unfriendly nation. It might even be a worldwide virus of pandemic proportions. But whatever it is, it's still under God's sovereign control. David knew that and he embraced it. Listen to what he says in Psalm 33, beginning at verse 16. The king is not saved by his great army, a warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, 
on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Clearly, David recognizes something that every one of us need to recognize, namely, that it is ultimately sovereign Lord who saves us. Not a powerful army, not a legion of top scientists and immunologists, not politicians, no matter what their political loyalties may be. At the end of the day, our salvation, both in a temporal sense and in an eternal sense, comes from God. It's like David says in yet another psalm, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. If I were to update that about 3,000 years, it would probably sound something like this. Some trust in military firepower and some in high-tech weaponry, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Bottom line is this, either, either you trust God or you don't. If you trust him, you don't need to trust in anything else. And if you are trusting in anything else, then you're not really trusting in him. Now, please understand, we're not talking about being stupid here. We're not talking about laying down in the middle of the road and trusting God not to let a car hit us. We're not talking about never washing our hands or using common sense, but trusting God to never let us get the coronavirus. As I said, we're not talking about being stupid here, but what we are talking about is the object of your trust. Either you're trusting in God's power or you're trusting in man's power. Either you're trusting in God's wisdom or you're trusting in man's wisdom. Either you're trusting in God's ingenuity or you're trusting in man's ingenuity. Either you're trusting in what God can do for you or you're trusting in what you and other people can do for you. In the crucible of real life human experiences, David had learned a very important lesson. There is no safety in trusting in human resources. And so with that in mind, he turns to the Lord in the darkest hours of his life. That's what Psalm 17 is really all about. It's about how David turns to God when his situation is dire. It's about how he turns to God when his circumstances are bleak. It's about how he finds hope in the Lord when his situation seems hopeless. So we can learn much from how David prays in this psalm. And some of us need those lessons now more than ever. If the COVID-19 epidemic has put fear in your heart, you need to learn to pray as David did in Psalm 56.3 when he says to God, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. If this current crisis has caused you to become anxious about your job and ultimately about your ability to even have food to eat, you need to remember the words of the psalmist when he says in the 37th Psalm, verse 25, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. If you have begun to wonder if the Jesus of ancient history is still the same today. You need to be reminded that the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of Tim Drury and Justin Falloon and you. What he has done for others, he can do for you. In fact, just saying that reminds me of the story of a man named Stuart Hamlin. Born in 1908, he became one of radio's first singing cowboys way back in 1926 at the tender age of 18. By the time he was in his 20s, he had become not only a singer-songwriter, but also an actor and a radio show host. In the 1930s and 40s, he appeared in movies with such cowboy stars as Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, and John Wayne. He's probably best remembered as the composer of the 1954 song, This Old House. However, despite his apparent success on multiple levels, he did not cope well with the pressures of high-profile living, and as a result, sought to escape through alcohol. 
On numerous occasions, his drinking landed him in jail for public brawling and other destructive behavior. However, because he was hugely popular in those days, his radio sponsors regularly bailed him out of jail and smoothed things over for him behind the scenes. Eventually, the combination of his drinking and gambling began to severely damage both his life and his career. And while it was in a downhill spiral, in 1949, at an early Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles, he was converted to Christ. And at that point, his life was dramatically changed. And a couple of years later, he would write what would become his best-known gospel song, entitled, It Is No Secret What God Can Do. It was, in some sense, autobiographical. So to those of you that are watching today who may be wondering whether the God of the Bible can touch your life in the same profound way that he touched the lives of men and women in Bible times, I want to close with some of the lyrics from that Stuart Hamlin hymn. The chimes of time ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell, was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Second verse. There is no night, for in his light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. And then that familiar chorus, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. I want to close with a word of prayer for all of you who are listening, and especially for those of you who are going through very stressful times, because I know that the God of the Bible, the God who is omniscient, omnipotent, and constantly concerned for his people, is more than able to meet you at the place of your need. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the promises that you have given us in the Bible. We thank you that you have committed yourself to keeping your word. And the Bible even says, let God be true and every man a liar. So we know in this moment that you would be delighted to meet us at the place of our need, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual or whatever it might be. And I pray for those who in their heart are ready to reach out to you and look to you for an inner strength and for a help that they cannot muster on their own. May these days of difficulty in America prove to be in their life not stumbling blocks, but stepping stones to a closer walk with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of Doubt blow through me, and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering and the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ.
Christ the sure and steady anchor While the tempest rages on When temptation claims the battle And it seems the night is won Deeper still then goes the anchor Though I justly stand accused I will hold fast to the anchor It shall never be removed Christ the sure and steady anchor Through the flood of unbelief Hopeless somehow Oh my soul now lift your eyes to Calvary This my ballast of assurance See his love forever proved I will hold fast to the anchor It shall never be removed Christ the sure and steady as we face the wave of death When these trials give way to glory As we draw our final breath We will cross that great horizon Clouds behind and life secure And the calm will be the better For the storm To the anchor, it shall never be removed. Thank you so much for joining and worshiping with us today, and I hope that your heart was filled with joy. This week, practice physical distancing, not social distancing. In a time of isolation, we need the social interaction and we need each other. And so I just want to give you maybe three ideas that you can help practice uh, being social while still maintaining that physical uh, separation to help um, join us together while we have to be far apart. And so here's a couple things. One, make a phone call this week. Pick up the phone and call your friends, call family, call your neighbors and check on them. Uh, have a conversation with them just to see uh, where what is going on with them and how you can help. Uh, maybe send them a text message as well. That's another great way to be engaged with people. Second thing is when you're making your meals this week, make extra and then take some to a neighbor. Put it on their porch and then send them a text and say, hey, just wanted to let you know I had some extra, was thinking about you, and just wanted to give you uh, some of what God has blessed us with. And so you're giving hope by sharing a meal together. And the third thing is if you're out enjoying the weather in your home in your yard this week, Say hi to your neighbors. Remember, we're coming out of winter and coming out of um, being isolated. And so be as social as you can by maintain, uh, while you maintain that distance between each other. And so don't be socially distant, but lean into the opportunities that God gives you and be socially aware of what is happening around you. Lean into those opportunities this week and see how God can use you to meet those opportunities. So glad you were here. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.